some familiar faces uh, and we wait for another one to one minute to let the other people arrive and meanwhile I ask you to say hello in the chat um, tell me like where are you sitting to get today where are you greeting us from so feel free to send a, a short message in the chat we would love to see your faces and um, see a wave maybe uh, so if you want to um, allow the camera feel free to do so and let's see so we have Miriam yes a familiar face from Toulouse hi welcome Martin from Dresden wonderful to see you again here on air and Elise from Paris uh, welcome Gilles <coughs> to meet you again. Tobias from Hamburg, Isabel from Brussels. I see Gilles Poirier also. <laughs> uh, salut. Yes. Hello, Gilles. Wonderful. And I'm so glad to welcome with us here today uh, Laurent Ledoux and my colleagues from the Next Gen Enterprise Summit, uh, uh, Luc Breton and Mili. Um, plus as well Luca that is joining us and supporting us for today's talk and who else has arrived so we have a international audience and from Montreal welcome Christophe as well from Belgium Francois from Clamart Paris Christophe from Mont Nantes welcome to everybody so this is really wonderful let us know where you are sitting today and say hi to everybody. And as well, I see friends from Switzerland uh, as well here. Welcome, Marilyn, for instance, from Fribourg, I guess. So wonderful, welcome to you as well. Um, yeah, I think we're getting there with uh, everybody joining and there will be some others joining. But meanwhile, I'd like to say a congratulations to a very special person today. And this is actually Luc Breton. Luc, uh, your book was coming out last week and I got an excellent uh, uh, one in my hands and I can really recommend it uh, to read it. I know that Laurent, our guest today, has as well a part in it. So this is wonderful L'Entreprise Nouvelle Génération, uh, the Next Generation Enterprise. Um, a lot of very wonderful insights and congrats for this uh, to everybody that has participated in it. We are meeting today uh, to talk about the topic, the leadership conversation you need to have to kickstart a transformation project. And when we talk about transformation, the next generation enterprise, it's about distributed governance. I guess, Laurent, that's um, So welcome to Laurent Le, the founder, partner and chairman of the board of a company based in Belgium. You are supporting the other companies to um, innovate in the governance of the company. You have been in different fields before uh, as in the Belgian Ministry for Mobility and Transport. While you are experienced in the banking sector, uh, are doing lectures about ethics today and much more. So, and that's what we are going to discover around the topic, the leadership conversation you need to have to kickstart a transformation project. So welcome to you, Laurent. I Thank you. Having you here, we had a wonderful chat already uh, last week and yesterday about the topic. I'm really looking forward for this exchange. So maybe as a start, like when you were in all these positions and what you're doing now uh, in the next generation enterprise, we're talking a lot about purpose. And I wonder what is your personal purpose when you are doing all this? Well, it's funny because I've had a, a very uh, varied career so far working in the private, public, not-for-profit sector, but I've kept the same purpose for the last 25 years, I guess, and it's, it is still the same, Wonderful. and it's very simple. It is to transform 
organizations which transform society. That's as simple as that. What? And that's what we do at Physis. We, we contribute, we accompany uh, large organizations which want to, to change the way they, they function in order to have a, probably a bigger impact uh, on society through a better uh, internal governance. Wonderful. So we had as well a guest last week uh, of a company that you are supporting. Michel Ale was our guest for a friend mm -hmm. uh, thriving last week. Uh, wonderful. And we're really curious to hear about this. Maybe for all the ones that have joined us, so a warm welcome to and um, don't forget to like say a hello from where you're greeting us, where you're based. Use for this the chat. And uh, we will structure with Laurent this uh, hour that we have in front of us in three parts. So we will talk about why is this question so important, this uh, leadership discussion, and then on how to do it. And at the end, talking about the what. So it's quite that we were giving us and what we will do or what you will be asked is we will structure it in three parts and before or after every part we will ask a question and where you would be asked individually to think about you will get a timer um, from my end uh, so to reflect a bit and then to share your thoughts in the chat and we will hear one two voices um, to like what what is your opinion about it and then continue from there so that's about like what we plan for this hour and i suggest we jump into topic uh with laurent straight away so why is the question why do you say the leadership discussion that you need to have with uh, the the why the why so why why well basically i i thought about about our chat and i thought we can use simon sinek's uh, approach on huh? the why the how and the what and fundamentally my, my question which i think we should have with the ceo of the company willing to embark on such a journey it's really first why do you want to do it what is driving you uh, to to move into this collaborative governance, if you want to call it this way. And, um, and it's a fundamental question because everything starts there. If you don't have the right mindset to embark on such a journey, don't do it. Uh, that's basically my message. No, the question is, okay, what would be a good why in order to embark on such a journey? Um, there are several reasons you might think of. Um, definitely the complexity of the current business, businesses and, and world requires that you become more agile. So agility could be one of the reasons. Uh, we live in a VUCA world, etc. So we need to be more agile and that's why we want to embark on such a journey. All right, that's one reason. Another one is related to the engagement or disengagement of, of, uh, of the people working in your company. And you want basically to create a better work culture so that people feel more engaged. Another one also could be to have a, a bigger uh, social impact, uh, to, to change the, the social purpose of your, of your company. Um, and of course, one reason could be that you just want to improve um, shareholder value, right? And that's basically what has been driving so many CEOs for the last decades. Yeah. Now, my question would be, are you doing this ultimately in order to improve shareholder value or for some of the other reasons we just mentioned? And I would say, if in the end, what is really driving you is just shareholder value, I would say don't do it. And, because and why would you? Why? why? Because then you instrumentalize, uh, the, let's say, the approach. And you won't succeed in really engaging your people if the end goal is really to, uh, to improve shareholder value only uh, and you instrumentalize the rest. And I think it's important to realize this because, for example, what we fail to recognize is that there is an inherent tension between pursuing shareholder value as the ultimate goal and for example, increasing agility, which basically 
tries to improve customer satisfaction. And if in the end, what you pursue is just shareholder value, you cannot just instrumentalize uh, customer satisfaction or employee satisfaction. So I'm not saying we should sacrifice shareholder value, but we should recognize that it's more probably a constraint that you need to have decent or adequate shareholder value in order to be able to pursue in the long run the other objectives like social impact, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, agility, and so on. So are, so, you, saying, are you saying somehow that you would put the human uh, in the center with like, like a valid reason to go towards um, collaborative leadership or governance? Yes. Yes. I, human. I would say that it's, it, it's really making like an inversion uh, between what is today the ultimate goal, which is shareholder value under the constraint of being nice to your people, uh, offering decent customer satisfaction and so on. And I would reverse that. I would say the constraint is shareholder, shareholder value, but the ultimate goal is to increase your social impact, to increase employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, and so on. So basically the end goal is to optimize or to increase your impact on society in a positive sense. It may seem maybe idealistic, but I think it's much more realistic in fact than what we have been pursuing ideologically for the last 40 or 50 uh, years. So you're saying it's the wrong reason if it's about shareholder value and maybe you have a concrete example. Did you have people that you were accompanying um, where you found out that it was like a, it was like a hidden agenda to some my, 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 the point is that if if the people the CEO who, or the managing committee of a company is still believing this ideology of Milton Friedman that the first and, and ultimate responsibility of a, of a manager is to maximize shareholder value I think those people are not ready to embark on such a journey. They need to have, I would say, matured enough in order to feel that this is too short as an, ob an objective and that this kind of objective is precisely what is driving us at full speed against the wall. So they they need to have matured enough to recognize that there need to be a reordering of the priorities. It Once again, don't understand me wrong. I'm not saying we should disregard shareholder value. It's fundamental, it's important, but it's not the ultimate goal. It's one of the many goals we need to pursue. And I would say it's more a constraint than an, a goal in itself. And, and, and if people at the top of a company have not, let's say, realized that and internalized that, I think they will not be able to resist the difficulties or the resistance within their company, in, which is necessary to implement such a change. That's what I mean. So like one, one failure, if that would be the goal, is that you don't have the breath to go through difficult times because it has to do I would with say that. Change, I would say. a lot of change and that at first sight you would like at first difficulty, you would stop it. Is that what you observe? That's, that's what we have been observing. Yes, indeed, that some, some managers were thinking, oh, yes, we should you know, implement collaborative governance because we need to be more agile. And in fact, we need to be more agile in order to be more profitable. And this is really what we are after. Well, what we have seen is that they start and then they see it's much more difficult than what they expected. They also see that because of their inherent belief that in the end, the goal is um, uh, shareholder value, they are not really credible. They are not trusted by the people within their company to fully implement such a collaborative governance. So basically their attempts are met with cynicism, which basically slow down the, the process of transforming the organization in this way. And in the end, basically they are blocked and cannot, uh, cannot move forward anymore. And then they give up and go back to their former old ways. Yeah. Um, 
I have like a fundamental question that is shared by Jean-Yves Renaud um, that just wrote into the comments. Uh, so does it mean that change comes from the top? So like the the topic yeah. of talk is like what uh, yeah. what discussion one should have um, to kickstart the transformation project. Uh, like why say this? So should it come from the top? That's, that's a very good question. And thank you, Jean-Yves. Um, let's put it this way. Of course, the change could come from anywhere within the organization. Um, but in order for such a, in a radical change to be sustainable within an organization, it must be supported by the top. And so at some point, it needs to be fully supported and, let's say, initiated by the top. Because any attempt to do it from the bottom might be thriving for a while, but in the end, if it is not really supported by the top, it will be suffocated, will lose its momentum, and people will give up and either leave the company and do it elsewhere, or just go back to the ranks and be desperate, basically. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that such a radical transformation as collaborative governance is possible without a strong endorsement, if not start by the top management. It should be embodied by the top. Yeah, and um, so and we, we are basically basing our this uh, thesis to say, okay, there is more than one, um, because it could happen that if uh, the person on the top leaves, so if it's a small company, that you would go back to a different kind yeah. of... That's, that's basically, and that's what has been happening so many times, even after decades. I mean, look at Favi, for example which had been thriving uh, under a very unorthodox leader like uh, Zobrist. But once he left, basically, uh, his successor, who was still convinced of this, was basically, in a way, put aside by uh, the main shareholder and was not really able to continue on this path as with, uh, it was the case with uh, Zobrist uh, at the top. So it's... <laughs> It's very difficult to implement such a governance, but let's be clear also about it. It could be changed very quickly if at the top there is a, a radical change too. Um, at uh, at um, um, Pult, it is the same has happened uh, to some extent. So by asking this question of the motive or the why they're doing it, how do you realize if somebody is like just pretending like with the wrong, <laughs> How do you how do you go about this? It's, yeah, it's a very difficult one, uh, but you can feel that. You can feel that. I mean, nobody's perfect, and of course, even if you are convinced of this, you can feel sometimes that the people are not ready in their body language, in the way they would talk. But at least if they are convinced, they can start and learn and be coached in order to to embody really this change. Um, but yes, that's a kind of a, based on, on, on your experience uh, talking to people to, to feel whether they the stomach to really go, go uh, for this. But basically, the, the ultimate question then is what do you feel in your guts? It's really uh, uh, something that has to do with guts. I mean, and basically, I would say the ultimate question is, as a manager, do you feel that you, you don't want to manage any other way. That you are, you are basically saying, look, if I cannot try to go in this direction, I better quit from my position and try it somewhere else. I think if the person is not ready to say something like that, I think that person is not really ready uh, to go for it. Yeah. It's a tough call, <laughs> but I think, and that's probably the reason why there are still so few managers willing to go for it. But we see also that more and more are convinced and feel that that's really the right direction for their organization. Yeah. So um, can we like go for a short reflection with everybody here? Uh, I think it would be interesting to hear your opinions. I'm sure that we have some, uh, we have uh, some CEOs and leaders and people in um, in leading positions in companies that are with us or people accompanying this transition to distributed governance. And um, uh, I will put a question into the chat. 
right now. So uh, what drives you fundamentally to go towards a transformation of collaborative governance? So it's about what drives you, if this is something that you are pursuing in, in your companies or in your accompaniments that you do. Um, I will put the timer for two minutes and I ask you to take a, a short silent moment to think about this and then to share your thoughts in the chat. So I'll set the timer to two minutes now and I ask everybody here to think about this question um, and write what your result is, <laughs> what drives you fundamentally to go towards a transformation towards collaborative governance. Um, and let's take a silent moment and maybe Millie can put some music for this time of this two minutes. And we will then jump in right away again. is what drives you fundamentally to go towards a transformation of collaborative governance or distributed leadership or we call it as well self-organization please share what your thoughts are in the chat, 50 seconds to go. Wonderful comments already. Yes, yes. We will start commenting them in a moment. So, Laurent, you're following it as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for all your input. 13 seconds to go. So, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lily, for the music. And uh, yeah, we see a lot of comments from your side. How wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Have a look at it, Laurent. Yes, I, I did. And, and, and what is very interesting is that we see that people have a very different basic motivation for it. Uh, they are probably all related, but the way they are expressed are different because of the personalities, uh, because of what is important for them. Um, somebody, I think it's Jean-Yves again, mentioned something which I found interesting, which was saying nobody will want to admit it, but in the end, it's still, uh, you know, um, shareholder value, which which is the ultimate goal. Well. I know this has been the case for many managers, and they've really believed it for, for decades based on Milton Friedman's uh, ideology. What is very interesting to know is that before Friedman, before, let's say, uh, the end of the 70s, the uh, start of the 80s, uh, management was still uh, with the idea that their main responsibility was not just towards shareholders, but was really to try to balance uh, different stakeholders, um, you know, uh, needs and uh, and um, and purposes. So we, we see that we have evolved, not necessarily in the good way for the last 40 or, or 50 years. Uh, and now we see the dramatic results of that. And we are coming back to something more balanced, where we try to to look at management is really balancing the um, the objectives of different stakeholders, and that's why we see all kinds of calls for more varied composition within the board, not just representative of the shareholders, but also to have, let's say, critical friends or representatives or 
other stakeholders, society, uh, the environment, and so on within the board. So we see there are also changes there. But once again, in order to change the, uh, uh, the let's say, the, the governance of the organization internally, uh, you need to be driven by one of those objectives as those that have been expressed uh, so far. Uh, for example, none is left behind, uh, um, uh, meaning and more impact and responsibility for a better world, etc. whatever it is. And once again, what I want to stress is it is not sacrificing shareholder value, it's just, just putting it at the right, right level, more as a constraint than as the ultimate goal. Or like as a result, maybe? Could that be it? Like it's the result? Let's say as a result, but once again, not as the ultimate result. Result and the okay. ultimate Which is a very basic, very fundamental difference. Because people inside the company and even outside cannot really work their ass off just to increase the shareholder value. Some, some people believed it for some time at the top but nobody was really ever motivated by that in the long run. I don't think so, at least. And that's what we see coming up more and more. So maybe, maybe uh, can I invite one or two voices of uh, people that have written? I read like Tomia Stemben, you know, who's writing Building a Resilient and More Adoptive Organization. The environment is changing at the rapid pace. Top management alone cannot anticipate the full scope of change. Do you want to share your insight about this, Tobias? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, like this is coming from a more holistic perspective of uh, running an organization, such as an enterprise or any other kind of um, kind of social network. Um, right now, um, technology is shaping our organizations, and uh, impact also from social changes are uh, need to be anticipated by organizations and if you think about an organization of being in a form of a pyramid and just management being the one in charge of anticipating all this change, it's simply insufficient, right? Because the surface of the, uh, of the organization is towards the environment on multiple, um, on, on multiple spots. Yeah. And you, you have to uh, embrace the change coming into the organization also with the employees. Right, so we need to empower the employees to also anticipate and drive the change. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Thanks, and I, I'd like to give the, the word as well to Anne Chabert. You were writing that you were experiencing holacracy and what it made uh, for you. Do you want to share a few things that about what you just wrote? Why? Why would you go for that change? Sure. So, like I wrote. Um, my experience with self-management came from my experience as an employee in a holacracy company. I was working in, in holacracy and I just saw myself growing so much and being so happy going to work every day and experimenting so many different roles, um, different than the one that I was hired for in the first place. And then, you know, finding my place in this. So I found like if every company should, could experience that, Every employee could experience this um, broader range of things they could do would be amazing. Just a better work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is like this changing of the work life that is contributing to change of society. You were you were experiencing this yourself and growing your leadership skills, even though you were an employee starting the company. And if I can add something, maybe I feel like society has evolved in so many ways in the last decades, like the, the meanings of communications, the way we interact with each other. And now when we work from home and work culture hasn't evolved at such a high pace than the rest. So I feel now we have to make the move and to, to ask ourselves, is the world of today still adapt to the work culture that we have for decades, mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So we're like going. Thanks a lot for all your comments. That's yeah. precious. If you read through, thanks a lot, uh, and for sharing your experience. Um, and yeah, Laurent, what what do you conclude when you go through all these comments? Well, I I, I just when I listened to Tobias and Anne, I I, I thought about one of the first. <laughs> CEO with whom I uh, 
I started to work um, as a, let's say, a, a coach or mentor uh, within Fusis. And uh, basically the CEO, a lady told me, look, I just watched a video by Frédéric Laloux and I thought I need to change. I need to change radically my way of managing. I need to change my life. I need to change everything and I need help. So basically, can you help me to implement such a change? And, and she said, you know, it was like a call from within saying, no matter what, even if my bosses at the top level of the company uh, does not want, I mean, I will do it because I do believe that for me and for my organization, this is the only way forward. That's the type of gut feeling you need to have in order to embark on such a journey. So, I mean, Frederick Laluge, he's talking about purpose. Um, yeah. That be the thing that replaces shareholder value or are they like reasons yeah. feel like these are the reasons why one should change to resume? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And it must resonate with all your people within the organization as much as possible, at least. Of course, at the beginning, not everybody might be, you know, feeling exactly the same, but at least it must be something which which inspire a large group of people to want to 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 engage and go to work every day like Anne was saying uh, in the morning and it cannot be just that the objective I remember Carlos Brito from uh, InBev but it's about 20 years ago uh, I was with him in a, in a in a team meeting and he said basically our purpose is to increase shareholder value with 1% this year or something like that And, you know, people looked at themselves and said, is this really what we are working so much every day? Said, no, no. Yeah. It, is, it is necessary, of course, but it's not what motivates you. And that's the big difference. Wonderful. Yeah, so I suggest we move to the how. So, like, yeah. once, so, have a, well, once you, you agree that you're not just doing it for the maximizing shareholder value, the question is how. What kind of strategy will you follow in order to pursue this, this purpose, huh? this larger purpose? And I think if you embark on collaborative governance, uh, well, there are different strategies that you could follow, but in my mind, there is one a fundamental, um, let's say, way to do it. And maybe I let you, you know, reflect upon what could be this fundamental element we should agree with the CEO if or with yourself if you are the CEO on what it is really at the core the strategic core element of collaborative governance uh, what is it to resume it in the chat so that you can reflect on this question and ask like before you give the answer of course Laurent what your yeah. opinion is so what do you think um How do you want to pursue the transformation towards collaborative governance? What are the key elements uh, to take what Laurent just asked? Take a moment yeah. to reflect. What is the one or a few elements that you cannot miss or that you should agree with if you want to pursue uh, collaborative governance and implement it? So another two minutes, we will get some music for this and Mission Impossible is starting. Yeah.
have another. for the music um, yeah. uh, when we go through these comments yeah, yeah. I, I went through uh, uh, all of them or, or almost all of them at least um, and, and all are very good I'm not saying now that uh, some are more important than others uh, I like very much for example Philippe Ioannis uh, mentioned that really at the core there is personal transformation and starting at the top of course um, all this is right, and I don't want to, to contest this. What I would say, and I, I haven't seen it really, but what for me is at the core of collaborative governance is the readiness of the top to distribute leadership, uh, ba basically to, to share their powers. Uh, and in, in order to do this, of course, I agree with Philippe that you need, they need to be ready to work upon themselves. Uh, to transform themselves, to, to, to do this inner work. But to me, this is kind of very much related to the readiness of distributing leadership. And distributing leadership goes further than just distributing authority, because you, you can have formal authority and not act as a leader. So acting as a leader goes way beyond than just having some more powers. Uh, um, that's a nuance which I, I believe is important. But uh, you cannot have, in my mind at least, um, collaborative governance without this readiness to distribute leadership. So you're uh, saying all this is kind of related, I would say. Everything which has been said, for example, develop the purpose of the organization with the rest of the team, etc. Basically, this involves, this implies a readiness for distributed leadership. Uh, co-create a story that involve everyone. Uh, blah, all those those things that have been mentioned, a well-framed plan, or uh, what else have we seen, a, a true north, etc. To me, implies fundamentally. For example, like like I did as a manager, or like we do with companies we work with, that basically the purpose, the raison d'être of the different level of the company are, are really developed with the, the people themselves. And you invite volunteers in order to work on this with the, with the management at first, uh, but basically you include people. And, and through this, you are basically distributing or you start distributing leadership. Yeah. So I read one comment, which is about trust, uh, which is so yeah. fundamentally yeah. to like distributed leadership of what you're saying. And you say that you make a difference or there is a difference between just giving the authority. So that's basically mm -hmm. do yeah. uh, if you adopt holacracy, like yeah. from the moment you adapt uh, uh, the uh, you adapt holacracy, the, the authority is distributed and you're saying this is not enough. So can you no. like, with, well, like with the example, maybe what happened? Basically happen with the people so to take leadership that um right saying this doesn't happen just no. by well i mean the best proof is that in 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 a lot of organization today classical organization people of have authority uh, at some levels and still do not act as leaders so what's the difference between having formal authority to do things and being a leader to me being a leader is to have the willingness the liberty and the capacity to take initiatives in order to contribute to the resolution of the problems or to the accomplishment of the objectives of your organization. And this within a, a, a framework. But fundamentally, it's this feeling that you have the capability, you have the willingness you want, take initiatives. And that's, that's a very, and so, in this, you are ready even to go beyond the scope of your formal authority. Yeah. That's leadership to me. Yeah. Of course, this leadership, and that's what we create with approaches like Olacracy or others, it's not anarchy. It's not like 
you do whatever you want, wherever you want, however you want. No, you, you take the initiatives, but within a framework which allows for coordination within your organization without necessarily having somebody above you who tells you you may do this or, or, or you may not do that. that. So that's the big difference which I, I see. So holacracy is a, it's, it's a technique which is great, uh, no doubt about this, but as such, it is not enough by itself in order to, to create the potential, the willingness, the sense of freedom that people need to have in order to take leadership within their roles. Yeah. You need to do all kinds of other things related to that in order to, uh, to stimulate leadership and allow leadership at all levels within the organizations, within the roles that people have. Um, and so there is like one side is that the people that have not had yet uh, authority, mm -hmm. that yes. there is a magic to happen, that everybody is like taking responsibility and is uh, like showing leadership. And mm -hmm. explain why in so many companies that go towards distributed governance, leadership is like a term you should avoid. Do you do you experience? Yes, I think I think there is a a lot of misconceptions uh, about this. And, and it, it kind of relate to the question we addressed earlier on about, should it come from the top? Like if it would be taboo that it would come from the top? I don't think so. Uh, such changes require really leadership starting at the top, definitely. And of course, being allowed to be stimulated uh, within the whole organization but leadership is not taboo and leadership is not against uh, the possibility of respecting others, including others, etc. Uh, on this, we really need to, to reconsider a lot of our preconceived notions about uh, what it is to work collaboratively. Yeah. Um, and there is like the other side, I guess. There is the side of the leaders that have to like let go. So is that taking something away from them? Or what is your opinion? Yeah. What do you they see, them? <laughs> what, what we need, I think it goes with the wrong, mis wrong concept of leadership. We tend to see leaders as the hero, which have a big voice, uh, are in front of the team and always, you know, uh, you know, attract the team and their followers. Basically, we oppose leaders and followers. I think it's totally wrong. To be a leader, like one of my friend Mark Strom is saying, is to know when you need to be in front and when you stay behind. You see, and, and according to your roles and the situation, you take initiatives. In some other cases, you just follow. And to be a leader is to be a good follower when you need to be a follower and vice versa. Uh, that's the type of, of of mindset you need to instill within the company for holacracy or any similar approaches to work properly. And that everybody feels comfortable with being a follower when it's necessary, with taking the lead when it's, it's necessary within their roles, etc. And respecting others all the time, of course. What is the toughest thing to like for former leaders? We heard uh, Michel Allais last week talking about this, uh, his experience um, with the company. Uh, so, like in general, what do you think, Laurent, is the toughest for? Well, I mean, it's really tough for people who have been basically through their education brainwashed to act as heroic leaders. Uh, to, to realize that in order to stimulate leadership within their organization, uh, they need to act differently. And it's, it's very tough to find the right balance. Once again, to know when you take the lead, when you follow, how you, you, give, uh, you, know, you give advice or when you solicit advice in a proper way, uh, how to, to, to be a, a non-violent communicator and, and myself, I know I personally have a lot of progress to make uh, in, in this regard, like so many others who have been basically trained to be, uh, you know, heroic managers or leaders. Uh, all this need to, need to, to be 
yeah, you need to learn that, and it's not easy. That's really tough for for you know usual manager to make this journey. But it's also like Anne was saying, great because you learn so much about yourself, about others, how to help them grow in their roles, um, how how to to grow yourself. Um, but it's always to to find this delicate balance really between letting go and still being very proactive. I've met for the last month top CEOs of very large organizations saying, okay, we've initiated something similar to a lacrosse or whatever uh, for the last month uh, or years, and it's not working. Uh, and basically you discover that they considered that adopting such approach meant for them to just sit and watch and let people take initiatives. No, they should still take initiatives within their role as CEO, uh, which is to, uh, as Lalou also explains it, which is to protect the organization from some outside influence, which is to provide guidance, to, to be the fire, the inspirational fire, to promote this approach. So, I mean, definitely you still need to take you know, very strong positions, but in a different way than the one you did before. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, on the, how you're, you're saying that, so this is like one of the key things that you were experiencing. And I think that leads us to, to the what, so what, yeah. what are concrete steps to, to go there? And I, we were already starting it, but there might be other things. So like what, what else? Uh, okay, so let's let's recapitulate. If we agree that okay, you need to agree on the why, which is more basically than just the pursuit of shareholder value. Second, that you agree with the fact that it will imply to distribute leadership one way or another. Then the the next question is, what kind of distribution of leadership are you ready to implement? And uh, and there there is no dogma. You have all kinds of ways to do it. Olacracy is one way, and even then, olacracy you you can apply it with different ways. You can go very far or less far, despite what Brian is saying. I think there is much more flexibility in this kind of approach than he, he claims. Um, uh, you could be more uh, in terms of sociocracy. You could keep even a hierarchy of managers, but adopting different roles. Let's say, uh, for example, at Partena. We started by not, you know, diluting the managers. We said no; they will remain manager, but they will be manager coaches. Okay, but through the process, basically, manager coaches became lead links, uh, as as in in a kind of holacracy. But it was a gradual process. But what you need to define at first with the with let's say the top management is what kind of approach are you really ready to, to implement. And one of the key issues there for me is to discuss with them the business model this new approach might imply. Because uh, you know implementing distributed leadership, an approach in circles rather than a, 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 a usual pyramid uh, can lead to serious uh, rethinking about the business model about the métiers, as we call them, uh, about your um, customers, the kind of customers you want to, to, to serve and how you want to serve them. And uh, implementing collaborative governance can be a way to really profoundly rethink your organization. And so one of the questions we might ask to the top management, how far are you ready to go? Uh, are you ready really to reconsider your business model and the way you approach your market, your, um, your clients, uh, your social impact, etc.? So you're saying there is not a recipe, basically. No, there. definitely it's not. On like where the company stands. And I just read the Sasha Sigmund's comment saying, I think it's wrong to assume that everyone wants more autonomy or authority. Not all employees want more self-organization or self-leadership so that goes into that direction as well to say like okay what's the business model where or how far do you want to go um in which speed 
Uh, is that right? That is, that's right. I mean, I see that Michel, Michel Allais from Tartena is, is, is commenting right now. And uh, I think he, he, he could definitely uh, mention this himself, that one of the key drivers for implementing collaborative governance was precisely to change the way uh, Partena approach its clients by making or organizing multidisciplinary teams to, dis to serve better their clients. So really, it was not just about implementing collaborative governance as, you know, a way to make people feel better within the organization. It was also driven to serve better their customers. And that's fundamental. And, and once again, uh, it's not enough to discuss with the CEO, okay, are you ready for distributed leadership? But what does this imply uh, practically? Are you ready to reconsider your business model? Are you uh, ready to, to really transform the roles of, of managers, to atomize them, to dilute them? Uh, yes, no, how far are you ready to go? Those are the questions then we can address. And of course, the answer to this, as I just mentioned with uh, Partena, will evolve through, through time, but it's important to address those big issues at the beginning. Um, we have a question from Jean-Yves Renault asking, what is your goal or an opportunity found while moving to this governance? Are you asking this towards Laurent or to, towards Michel Allais? Maybe you want to comment your question. Jean-Yves, yeah. It was, uh, it was uh, for Laurent uh, because he mentioned the change or the, the, the change of the business model that... Uh, at Partena, and I would like to know if it was a goal from the beginning or a, yeah. an opportunity that was found while moving to this governance. And because well, we know that in, in the path, you, you find some opportunities, other opportunities, and definitely. you discover that you can do other things. Now, in the case of Partena, it was clear that they had thought about this way before thinking of implementing such a collaborative governance. And basically, they had already uh, you know, defined this new approach uh, before uh, calling for people to work with them in order to implement the collaborative governance. So they, they were really ahead with that. But in some of the cases, uh, we are discussing with the CEO of top management of organizations, and they feel we need to become more agile. Uh, we need to, uh, to, to, to take care better of our people and create a better uh, work atmosphere. And by thinking about the possibilities which are offered by collaborative governance, they realize that it can change fundamentally the way they think about their business. Uh, I, I'm working currently at Physis with um, a, a, a mutual insurance company uh, in, in Belgium. And basically, they had problems with the way their um, study and research department was functioning because it was scattered across the organization and, and they were not really, they were thinking, well, we are not really very good at it. We don't know how to, to make this work. Can you help us? So their, their scope was very limited with basically study and representations within some uh, other organizations and how to influence and, and position themselves. And by showing them the power of the approach in circles, they say, God, we could rethink totally, not just the, the, the people working on studies and representation, but which we could reconsider the whole organization based on this approach, uh, you know, based on circle and, and purposes. And that's where you see the power then of, uh, of such approaches. Um, which goes beyond just implementing, uh, you know, or favoring or stimulating inclusion, autonomy, uh, personal uh, growth, and so on. You can really rethink the organization. Yeah. Perhaps, Michel Allais, you would like to, to add a word on that, uh, on this question by uh, Jean-Yves Renaud? I would confirm what uh, Laurent has said. Uh, good evening, everybody. And good evening. Uh, the, fact, the fact is that um, defining a new business model was in, indeed at the very beginning uh, the main objective. But nevertheless, um, we were convinced as a management that autonomy or more 
power, uh, more opportunities to take initiatives. That would be the, the right way to formulate what we meant with autonomy at that time. There was something that was for us uh, very clear as since 2017, I would say. So one more than one year before we started with the collaborative governance as such. So it was a conviction that we had to share uh, the opportunity to take initiatives. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, so we are approaching the end of our hour that we spent together. And uh, I would like to open, though, we were in the what to do, what else to do. So you were saying, Laurent, it's about as well that the business model could change and, and around uh, the business processes to group things differently. Is there a question from you all that you'd like to, that you burn to ask Laurent about his experiences uh, and if you have that, feel free to uh, unmute your mic and to ask your question. Yeah, who can I hand the words to? Somebody unmuted the mic. Yes. <laughs> Leonard. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good yes, uh, yeah, I'm Leonard. I'm uh, calling from Canada. I have a question to Mr. Laurent. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I do appreciate that it is always important to have a business model. But sometimes as a CEO, you may find that in your team, there are some who are not following you or who have other ideas and that that may be a problem to you to to do what you are supposed to do in that case what can be the strategy to yeah maybe also from your experience you have made this kind of situation how one can deal with this thank okay, you that's a very very good question thank you Leonard. um well for example when i was uh, the let's say ceo or president of the ministry of transport i i started within an organization where they never thought about how they satisfied the citizens with their services. And uh, they had a strategy that which had been always thought by the top management given to the minister and never properly shared with the people within the organization. So what I did basically was to invite all volunteers from the, the organization, we were about 1,100, to work with us, with the, the top management, on a new strategy. And we had about 100 volunteers uh, from all levels within the organization. And we started together to develop a new strategy. Uh, and the advantage was, OK, not everybody was present. But the, most, the people most uh, interested in it from any level within the organization were so that we had a strategy finally which integrated as much as possible the preoccupations and the objectives of people at various levels. Now, of course, um, it's impossible to have you know everybody fully agreeing with your uh, with whatever is defined, and that's where some tools, decision making tools like decision by consent, can be very useful. Uh, the purpose of decision by consent is not to have consensus, but to make sure that nobody has a fundamental objection towards uh, or to implement what you what is proposed as being the strategy. And and if you if you look for it uh, through the web, you will see ways to implement such decision making process. It's very efficient, very strong, and uh, basically, okay, not everybody will be fully happy with the with whatever is decided by the group or proposed either by the CEO or by somebody else, but at least nobody could fundamentally object to it. And I believe that this helps really uh, to find quickly uh, a solution, which is the way forward, basically. Thanks a lot, Laurent. So we are approaching the end of our time together. And I would look like, before I hand over the to Luc for the last word, Laurent, uh, is there a conclusion that you would like to share with us 
of uh, the topic of the leadership conversation you need to have to kickstart the transformation project? No, a conclusion I, I, I don't. I was I felt very happy to share with you those insights. Uh, this is, I mean, I'm so happy myself to be able to work in such an, an environment within physics where we apply those this collaborative approach and where we share it with, with our partners like uh, Michel, uh, like other uh, clients. It's such, I mean, personally, it's such so gratifying to do this job. So I'm, I'm just a happy person and I wanted to share that with you and, and hope that you, if you are not yet doing it, that you will do it uh, quickly with this gut feeling that this is the way forward. Wonderful. So thank you very much, Laurent, uh, for your insights, your thoughts, and uh, your experience that you were sharing with us. And uh, I was glad to see some of your colleagues from Physis as well being with us tonight. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the time. Uh, so big applause uh, to, to, to you being with us um, uh, here on the Next Gen Net. And uh, with this, I'd like to hand over to Luc Breton. Uh, we have wonderful announcements to make, though Corona is hitting us again. So please, Luc, uh, would you share what we are going to do? Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, congratulations uh, to you for uh, this session and to Laurent. Uh, it was really a, a great moment. And also to Yannick Bolatti, uh, you both, Laurent and Yannick, uh, drive Fuzzis. And, uh, I think Physis is definitely a pioneer organization uh, supporting major companies in, in Europe through this distributed uh, governance we described this evening. And um, you have a European ambition for this purpose and I think you, you will make it. And um, I personally definitely want to support uh, organizations and people like you are because it's at the end a matter of engagement and uh, people mindset and you are great guys on, on that side, congratulations. Uh, so we, uh, my last word uh, will be for um, uh, the Next Gen Enterprise Summit. We know that we are in the last mile uh, for the organization of this, uh, of this event. Um, just to let you know that we will um, uh, be able to open some session more largely. Uh, so if you're not yet registered, you just have to send me uh, an email and you will get an invitation uh, for these sessions that we will open uh, more largely. Uh, we will have a, a virtual event in addition uh, to the physical recording at the Ministry for Economy and Finance in Paris. We hope we will be able to make it for the moment. It's still maintained, but who knows? And um, if it's closed, we have a backup uh, scenario. We uh, will be in a studio. Uh, we booked in parallel. And in this case, the event will be virtual for attendees, 100% uh, or 99%. And in any case, so we will uh, do this event and we will prepare a surprise in addition to Zoom, because we are a bit fed up with Zoom. It's a great tool, but we will have the opportunity to join, you will have the opportunity to join us in a complete virtual world. And the first invitations for this complete virtual world for the Next Gen Summit will be sent tomorrow. Um, so if you're not in the first um, uh, sending of, of this, uh, please wait, you, you will receive it. And um, so it will be great. Um, and last thing, uh, thank you, Suzanne, for mentioning the book, L'Entreprise Nouvelle Génération, The Next Gen Enterprise. Uh, this book, you probably know, is intended for uh, business leaders uh, who are aware of the limits of their organization uh, governance um, and all the leaders that want to change uh, things in the real life, just like Laurent and uh, uh, Michel Allé uh, and Yannick Bolatti, he, he, he didn't uh, speak, but they are doing it on a, on a daily basis and they are part of this book. Um, and um, yeah, that, uh, that's a great news. You, you can uh, read this book and uh, thank you also to Ola Spirit and Fabric, our partners for these sessions. I wish you a, a great evening. See you soon, because this is the last drive-in before the summit. See you at the Next Gen Enterprise Summit. If you want to be part of it, remember, you just have to send me a mail 
or to Suzanne um, and uh, see you there. Have a great evening. Thank you again, Laurent. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 And we are listening to some music to say...